So uh, my disclosures, and in the spirit of Sandy's disclosures, I would say I have had an NG tube. No one's ever going to stick me with acupuncture needles. I'm not running for president, so I won't discuss my cannabis use. And uh, <laughs> I haven't had a massage, but I'm willing to try. OK, so <laughs> I'm supposed to talk about um, an old therapy. So they get the old dogs to talk about old therapies. And we're going to talk about 5-ASA use in IBD. So just to, to review, um, the aminosalicylates block uh, rachidonic acid pathways, both um, the, the lipoxygenase pathway and the cyclooxygenase pathway, and therefore are very effective as local anti-inflammatory agents. And it's very helpful, I think, when I, when I explain it to my patients, I explain it as topical therapy. So if you were able to get your hand down into the uh, lumen of your bowel and smear a cream on the bowel and decrease inflammation, that's, that's basically how these agents work. Um, and to decrease inflammation. What's new or what's newest about them? It's the uh, same wine in different bottles, so we have different um, release mechanisms to help deliver. The, the key is that the agent itself is very pH sensitive, so you need to come up with some mechanism to deliver the active ingredient beyond the stomach. The earliest uh, uh, formulation was basically bacterial um, uh, to avoid um, degradation of the agent was to bond it to um, sulfa, and therefore you can have bacterial cleavage in the colon and release the active agent in the bowel, aka sulfasalazine. Over time, recognizing that there certainly are patients who are sulfa allergic, and we need to come up with some way to deliver the drug without sulfa, and that is why there have been both time release, which is basically moisture sensitive release mechanisms, or the pH dependent coatings. Um, I will say, though, when we get into what do you really do, I still like the sulfa-bonded um, formulation of sulfasalazine. It can be a little tough. Some people get rash. Some people find it a little bit stomach upsetting. But for those who tolerate it, it's one of those classic second opinion things that you learn. If you haven't tried sulfasalazine, you should try it. You might just like it. Why do we like these agents as pediatric IBD folks? Well, when you really look at the ever-growing armamentarium, which we're all spending so much time this weekend sitting through sessions, learning more and more about all the new drugs, at the end of the day, we have very few that are actually approved in pediatrics. Um, grandfathered in is prednisone, but none of us really want to use it. There's a sulfasalazine or azolfadine brand name, which it was grandfathered in. This colazol, which has approval in pediatric UC. And then we have now two anti-TNFs, one for both UC and Crohn's, um, aka infliximab, and one for pediatric Crohn's, aka adalimumab. And so we all grew up with these agents, and it's very hard to move out from home, and so we feel very homey with them. But let, let's look at the um, data about them and what perhaps are the best ways to use them and perhaps the best ways not to use these agents. So this is uh, data that was generated by uh, Sylvia Ophi and from the Pediatric IBD Collaborative Research Group um, looking at how much we actually use these agents. And this is as of 2012 data cut, so not that old. And this is looking at kids with uh, Crohn's disease. And lo and behold, 86% of kids by um, three years were exposed to 5-ASA agents to manage their uh, pediatric Crohn's disease. What's even interesting is how it grew over time, right? So if you look at quarter one, almost two-thirds of the patients were placed on a 5-ASA, and even as we follow out over time, it seems to be something, well, if we haven't tried it yet and they're not doing well, let's, let's go to it. So by quarter one, you have two-thirds of the kids exposed, but by quarter 12, you have 86% of kids with pediatric Crohn's disease in this multi-center collaborative who have been uh, given 5-ASAs to treat their Crohn's disease. But what's really the data? The data is that it doesn't work in Crohn's disease. Now, I will submit that these are all adult studies. We have very limited pediatric uh, high-quality data looking at the efficacy of these medications in Crohn's disease. But if you look at um, the, the effect of maintaining remission with 5-ASA in Crohn's disease, a very modest at best treatment effect. The one uh, real placebo-controlled, randomized control trial that I could find showed very poor maintenance of remission using these agents for Crohn's disease. What about ulcerative colitis? Well, if we go back to that sort of model of this is topical therapy that I'm putting on the mucosa, 
Well, that sounds like all sort of colitis, right? It's, an, it's a mucosal disease, whereas Crohn's disease is a transmural disease. Why would we even think that it would work with, in a systemic transmural disease? Maybe it's got a better shot in um, a, a mucosal disease like all sort of colitis. And so it shouldn't surprise any of us if we use it a lot in Crohn's disease. Certainly, we must go to this agent a lot in all sort of colitis. And I think the only surprising thing in this slide is that at by quarter 12, 96%, not 100% of kids with all sort of colitis have seen five ASA therapies for their uh, pediatric ulcerative colitis, and I wonder who that other 4% are. Perhaps those are Sandy's patients out getting a massage and smoking dope. <laughs> <laughs> um, as far as the outcome of five ASA therapy, so how good do these really work? I showed you the abysmal uh, re long-term remission data in pediatric Crohn's disease with five ASA. What about the ulcerative colitis? So again, from the Pediatric IBD Collaborative Research Group um, from Bella Zeisler, uh, was the first author in his paper looking at long-term outcomes, and, and the, the punchline is that 40% of patients on 5-ASA for pediatric ulcerative colitis remained in long-term steroid-free um, clinical remission. So they definitely do work in ulcerative colitis um, at least 40% of the time. I would submit if you look at this paper, what's really interesting is that only a third of the patients were actually giving rectal 5-ASA or rectal therapies. And in treating ulcerative colitis, I, I think that if, if I can give you one pearl or, or the sort of the new thing, which is actually the old thing, is to remember, uh, as I tell my patients, taking medicine by mouth to treat your rectum is about as inefficient as you can get. And using topical therapy to treat the rectum can be very effective. All the data supports this. Now, this is all adult-generated data, and you could come back at me and say, wait, whoa, whoa, time out. Two-thirds of Adult patients also have limited left-sided disease, whereas 80% of pediatric patients have pancolitis. So will rectal therapy work just as well in kids? I would tell you, absolutely, because what really makes your patients miserable is an inflamed rectum. So for any of you, so I'll give more uh, disclosure, uh, sort of in a, a ironic um, IBD dinner, uh, the kosher meals were obviously tainted, and so all the kosher keeping pediatric and adult gastroenterologists had food poisoning for the next week. So it was very hard to get a gastroenterologist in New York during that week because we were all sick in bed. And I could tell you from having had uh, acute colitis, it is really miserable. I remember laying in bed um, around 2 o'clock in the morning thinking about my 10th bowel movement that day and decided maybe it'd just be better to go into, in the bed and not crawl back into the bathroom. It's sheer misery to have um, an inflamed rectum. And so if you want to make your patients better quicker, um, and to make them more happy. Rectal therapy, I think, is, is very often the forgotten part of ulcerative colitis management in pediatric UC. There's a lot of talk about 5-ASA and um, is the dose important? Well, we should remember that if we have different um, modes of administration, the delivering, the active ingredient that you get to the colon does depend upon which wrapper you put the, the um, drug in. And so at the end of the day, though, this is 80, 78% uh, of this drug is not absorbed. You have only 22% absorption. So if you're worried about systemic side effects and whatnot, more is better. Although on an adult uh, basis, going to 4.8 grams, going above that, you don't seem to get much effect. So if you're not pushing the dose up to at least 4.8 gram equivalent, you're probably not giving full, full effect of the drug. It's worth at least giving try before you move on. There's a lot of talk about is it better to give it four times a day, three times a day, two times a day, one time a day, uh, sort of feel like an auctioneer. The most important thing, and we'll go through the adherence data is, as C. Everett Coop said, medicines do not tend to work well for patients who don't take them. So it's very important that we make sure that our patients take the, their, their 5 ASA. Perhaps one of the um, problems with some of the older medications is they were marketed as QID or TID. There's almost no reason to give any of these drugs any more than twice a day. Um, although there is a big push to once a day dosing, the true data proven that once a day dosing gives you better adherence than twice a day dosing is lacking. So at least uh, twice a day, or even if you can convince your patient to do it once a day, um, it seems to be the best way to dose these medications. Is once a day superior to twice a day? That remains to be a question, and you get into, but it gives you some leeway in bargaining with your patients, right? You know, if you'll take it once a day, but you miss that dose, you've missed the whole day dose, maybe twice a day, I could at least get once a day in you, and let's see if it works. Um, but I would really encourage you, for those of you who are dosing these medications, TID or QID, you're, you're destined that therapy to fail. Um, so this is the abysmal adherence data. We know that basically it's the modern, it's, it's, it's a, a expected 
um, human experiment. If I'm doing really well on a medication, is that because it works really well, or is that because I don't need it anymore? Well, there's only one way I can answer that question. I'll stop taking my medicine. Oh, I got sick. I guess I guessed wrong. And so most of our patients do that experiment at some time or another. And that's why we all learn how to take a good history when we take uh, medication history. Never ask the patient, um, are you taking what I prescribed? Ask them, what are you taking? And when they tell you, well, what you told me to take. Okay, what was that? Well, you know, that medicine, what's the name of it? I don't remember. How many times a day? I don't know. Chances are they're not taking what's prescribed. Um, so Susie Kane taught us about this and, and basically showed us that, again, on the top bar, those are the patients who were taking their 5-ASA, and long and uh, lo and behold, they were in long-term remission. And surprise, surprise, those who became non-adherent tended to lose uh, maintenance of remission. The CCFA did a survey of patients to look at why do patients stop taking their, their medication, and there were all sorts of reasons, but basically the overwhelming reason was, well, I forgot. So we all know what that is. That's code for I have a lot of issues with taking this medication, and I think the, um, the, this disease called non-adherence is fascinating, and, I, and I, I, uh, especially for the young bucks, more people need to really study this very well, why people don't take their medication. Saying I, I forgot, that's you know sort of like when my kids, when I was young and I get home at 10 o'clock at night and they didn't take out the garbage can, I ask them why, because they forgot. I was like, really? Because you forgot? You didn't forget to check your Facebook page. You didn't forget a lot of things. This, you just didn't want to do it. And that's what I forgot really means. Um, so Neil Laiko has taught us um, about non-adherence, very interesting data that he's generating using this um, big brother technique, this MEMS cap. Um, where you have an electronic chip in the cap of the bottle. So Big Brother's actually watching, are you opening up the bottle? And knowing that someone is watching over your shoulder, about 50% of the time are our patients compliant with their therapy. So you can only imagine when Big Brother isn't watching what happens. Um, and it is interesting, if you break it out, the adolescent data is even uh, less um, than 50%. The, the higher numbers are where our patients are um, being given their drugs by their parents. So in conclusion, hopefully I've told you what you already know, and that's you in this audience as a pediatric gastroenterologist use 5-ASAs a lot. Um, we do tend to prescribe it. We see it. We are still prescribing it for Crohn's disease, although that's with very little uh, data. A big part of this meeting is, okay, you've presented the data and you presented what you said, but what do you really do? So. I'll come clean. Yes, I have written 5-ASA uh, prescriptions for patients with Crohn's disease. Perhaps there is a phenotype that that's right for. So our young kid with isolated colonic disease um, that has more of a Crohn's-y feel but sort of a UC phenotype, would I try a 5-ASA there first? Absolutely. And I don't think it's ever wrong to start any therapy as long as you carefully monitor. And I think that's a, a big thing that emerges from meetings like this, and I think that's very important to take home. So you could try it, but then don't just say, I'll see you in six months and see if you're doing okay. You're going to follow a Calprotect, and you're going to follow other lab markers and see if there's really a response. The other thing that I find very helpful with that, you start talking about immunosuppression and this and that and the other thing, and the parents want to try asparagus. I heard that really works. Okay, let's get a meeting of the minds somewhere in the middle. Let's try this. Let's, let's say we're going to repeat a calprotectin in three months. Let's see if we really see a fall. And if so, great, we'll embrace this therapy. And if not, we know when to move on. And, and you really um, can then work with your patients to find a type of therapy that you are comfortable with. We recognize that about 40% of our patients will be in corticosteroid free remission at one year in ulcerative colitis. So these therapies really can work very well in pediatric ulcerative colitis. And the key there may be adherence. Are they taking it enough? And um, so just to give a, uh, a plug, I think that's what the PROTECT uh, cohort is going to teach us as we really look at optimizing the therapies that we use today. And the other pearl that I, heard I left you with is don't forget the rectum. Okay. Thank you.